jazz. Give it to, uh, Jeff asked me to come out and talk about jazz a little bit. It kind of took me by surprise. And uh, I just want to say jazz is really about commitment. Being able to just come out and commit yourself to something. After you've practiced, you know, you can't be thinking about that when you're playing. You just come out and you commit yourself. Uh, it's about being in the moment. It's about reacting to whatever happens around you at the time. Um, it's about a lot of things, actually. Uh, somebody, uh, I was talking to Kyle. Is Kyle here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right here. I had breakfast with him this morning. He said, how did I get started playing jazz? And uh, I had to think about it. And I remember when I was 14 years old, I got my first band together, and we started doing weddings and bar mitzvahs. And uh, I got tired of playing the same songs over and over again. I asked my trumpet teacher what songs I should learn. And uh, I just started playing the songs. And then I started to embellish the songs after a while. You take the melody, you embellish it. I didn't know about chords or anything back then. So I just started embellishing the melody. And then I started embellishing the melodies I was making up. And little by little, I was improvising. You know, later on I learned about chords, the structure and whatnot. But that's how I got started. I'll give you an example, of like one of the first songs I learned how to play. You know. After a while, they got real boring, you know. So. You know, one thing leads to another. That's what jazz is. All right. So, um, so being in the moment, a willingness to make a fool out of yourself in front of people. You know, so you have to lose the fear of being a fool. You know, you just got to get out there and do the best you can at the moment. You know, because that's all you can really do is the best you can at that moment. You know, and you have to be fearless. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some things that I see young people do all the time. Is uh, you got to remember that uh, jazz has a lot of different. Feelings, you know, depending on the genre of jazz, whether it be Dixieland or swing or bebop, just like uh, you know, classical music has different genres. If you play Beethoven, you play a certain way. If you play Mahler, you play a different way. You know, it depends on the genre. You have definite little nuances about each style. So, but the one thing that's common with all the styles and genres of of, of jazz is that its origin comes from Africa. The rhythms. You know, and that's the six-eight rhythm. You know, and that evolved into swings. Right. So most figures have a six-eight feel. Should have a six-eight feel. Like it's uh, a lot of times uh, young people interpret. Uh, swing feel as a dotted eighth sixteenth, dun, 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 dun. and that's when you say it starts to sound corny or stiff or something like that. So you got to remember, uh, I think Pete Chrisley, uh, the great sax player in LA, always says practice soloing in six eight in, in triplets, because that's where you really start to get the feel of swing, and that's where swing comes from. But um, I was going to talk off the top of my head, and then I realized I had so much to talk about, and I was afraid that I was going to miss some stuff. So I figured I'd write stuff down and add some structure to my improvisation. So I, I also gave it to Tim up there, and he put it on, he's going to put it on the screen so you can see my chord changes. All right, so I'm pretty much going to read what I wrote, and then I'm going to interject stuff, all right? So starting with the fact that I think that jazz is like a spoken language. It's like a spoken language. The notes are the words. The phrases are the sentences. Now, when you speak English or any, any language, if you don't have an idea behind your sentence, the sentence becomes just words. So uh, if your phrases haven't got, don't have an idea or you don't have expression behind the phrases you play, they just become notes, all right? So let's talk about the notes now. Notes, every chord has a scale. 
Uh, I don't know if you've seen theory books. They get names for every Lydian and Mixolydian and Iolian. I never learned those terms. I just know that when I see a, you know, uh, an e, uh, e half diminished seven chord, I know what scale to play, or a, a, a C augmented ninth chord plus five, I know what scale to play. I never learned the names of those things. But it's important to know at least what they are because that gives you a wide choice of notes to play in any given chord, you know? So you learn the scales, you learn the arpeggios, you know, and then you have a palette for painting at that point. So uh, scales give you a variety of notes to choose from, you know, uh, like I said, like if you have a, any, any chord, you know what the colorful notes of that chord are, you could choose them, you know, you don't have to think about it, it just comes automatically. And that's something you have to practice and you have to study. So phrases, Interesting phrases have shapes and they have colors. What does that mean? Shapes, when you play, when you speak, for instance, you speak you know, with expression. You go up and then you kind of go down and, and all this kind of stuff. That's what makes uh, it interesting to listen to a person when they talk, which might not be in my case right now, but <laughs> uh, you try to make it interesting. So music has the same thing. Melodies have to have a shape to be interesting. Colors create intensity. Picking certain notes in a particular scale creates tension and release in any given, in any given phrase. Mm -hmm. So I already talked about the upward motion of uh, movement of melodies that are the shapes that express emotion. Without that, it sounds pretty bland. You know, I remember having a, a 10th grade uh, algebra teacher who always spoke like this. I almost failed that class. It was so monotonous because, you know, you want in teachers that are interesting and can grab your attention and all that stuff. Well, the solo was the same way. You know, you have to be able to shape your, your phrases to keep people interested. Um, this is theory. I'm talking theory now. You know, jazz, a lot of jazz is based on a dominant seventh chord. Does, it, does that, everybody know what a dominant seventh chord is? Kind of? Who doesn't know what a dominant seventh chord is? All right. Uh, it's, it's a chord, like in any given scale, for instance, if you're in a key of C, you know, C, the C chord would be the one chord, right? And the G seventh, which is uh, G, B, D, F, that's the dominant seventh chord. That chord always wants to go to one. It always wants to resolve to one. In classical music, the dominant seventh chord was always used to create an urgency to re resolve to something, you know. So, and, and of course, all the great composers, they put this dominant seventh chord and then they give you a surprise chord. It doesn't go there, you know, it's kind of tricky, kind of nice, you know. So a, um, a cadence, for instance, you remember theory, they talk about cadences? You know, four, five, one, you know, it's a complete phrase of chords. The five chord or the dominant seventh chord wants to resolve, it wants to resolve. And one of the reasons that jazz was so unpopular when it first uh, arrived, especially to people who were not used to hearing that dominant seventh chord as the one chord. Does that make sense to you guys? It starts with a dominant seventh chord with an urgency to move, but it doesn't. It just stays there. If you listen to rock and roll, it's do 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 It's just a dominant seventh chord pounding at you, and it makes people uncomfortable who are not used to it. Wait, where is it resolving to? It's not. It's just staying there. So that's one of the things about jazz, that it's about tension. And so you take a chord that already is supposed to have tension, it becomes the norm, now it doesn't have tension. So how do you build tension in there? You find notes within that chord that create more tension, you know? And uh, so that's what I was gonna say. Colors come from the extensions of a dominant seventh chord. Uh, for instance, the ninths, the elevenths, the thirteenths, right? You find out what those notes are, right? And then, there are extensions to that. The flat nine, the augmented nine, the sharp 11, the flat 13. And when, if you were to write out a scale, an entire scale, a dominant, you know, like a, say G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, that's, that's a dominant scale, right? 
and then you start adding the extensions on top of it, right? You could make up triads and entire new chords and scales based just on the extensions of that chord. So you start interjecting that in your solos, that's what add, adds color. It adds tension, it, and depending on how you use them and how you resolve them, it, it, makes, uh, it gives it, uh, the solo a lot more interest. So you, of course you combine that with the shapes and you got a great solo going, right? All right this is theory. All right, so we have, uh, we have those things, the effective, uh, effective resolutions come from effective tension, right? All right, so that's all theory. Now, the rest of it is so something more. It's about expression. It's about, it's something spiritual, something that comes from inside, all right? I need some water. So suppose you study all the theory. You're in your room. You know all the colorful notes. You know about melody, and you got all the scales and arpeggios under your belt and all that, and so now, you know, so the, what do you do with it now, you know? You gotta get out and practice. And, and practice has to be out in front of people with other bands. This is where you actually learn how to do stuff. You know, you practice certain things in your room, then you go out and use them. Um, uh, like for instance, I was gonna say that like children, you, you, children know this very well, you know, you take a little, two-year-old, or actually children start speaking when they're a year and a half, they start learning words. They can't wait to use them. They're just using them all over the place. They're not making sense, but they're trying to use them. They're mimicking adults and they're trying to, you don't see children sit in a closet all day talking to himself, you know? He, he just can't wait to, to communicate. It'd be weird to see a kid in his closet talking to himself, practicing the words he learned. So, you know, a lot of jazz musicians do the same thing. They learn stuff, they learn stuff, and they just sit in their room practicing all day, and they never come out and learn to communicate with people. So, you know, that's kind of ridiculous to sit in your room all day. Uh, so um, you, you, wanna, you wanna get out there and get used to making mistakes in public, because in actuality, there are no mistakes in jazz. You could always find ways to fix it, and, and uh, the more experience you have, Every time you paint yourself in a corner, you, you learn how to get out of them, you know. You just start learning how to get out of them. So do your, all your practicing and get out to play. Learn to let go and surrender everything to a higher power. I really believe this because, you know, and this goes to uh, as far as any kind of music you play or anything you do. You do all your practicing at home. You do everything you can do. And then when it's time to perform, you can't get nervous. You shouldn't get nervous because at that point you did all you can do and then you just give it up. You surrender everything and you just know in your mind that you're just gonna do the best you'll do at that moment and be fine with it. Don't get nervous because being nervous is gonna make you uh, make more mistakes and uh, probably apt to play less well, you know. So I, I'm a believer, don't be nervous, you know, fight that. All right, uh, and you could tell, um, Good players uh, that won't let go because they have amazing abilities. There's guys who, who really have a lot of chops, uh, but they don't have any impact. You listen to them and they're playing a lot of notes and they got amazing ability on their instrument. It just doesn't do anything for you. Those are people who really are not playing from the heart. They're playing from, the, from, from ego. They're playing for, uh, from the, just technique. They're not, they have not yet let go. So those are the people, you don't want to be one of those guys. There's a lot of them. The majority of the people are out there just playing a lot of notes and stuff. They're not really saying much. Or at least they don't touch someone's heart when they play. So the, the essence of music is expression, not perfection. You know, expression is what you're after in music. Perfection, you, you do that in the practice room, but when you're performing, you're going for perfection. You know? So let go. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. I'm reading myself, I'm going, oh, that's good. Who wrote this? <laughs> so you wanna let go of this obsessive need to sound good all the time. You know, we do that. We all have that, that thing, like, we wanna sound good. And, you th and then the, the fear comes from not sounding good and, and all that is ego-based, you know. Uh, it doesn't really matter. You just go out and do the best you can. And, and this, this holds true in any situation, whether it be professional or amateur or anything. You just wanna go out there and have fun 
and let go of all this fear. You don't have to sound good all the time. You know, you learn from not sounding good, as a matter of fact. Um, I saw an interview once with Celine Dion, where she said that one of her toughest times, uh, when she had laryngitis one time, a throat infection, and she had to perform. And uh, she was really surprised, because that's when she got the best reviews. And all the people thought that she was fantastic. And uh, she went on to say that she thinks it's because she didn't have chops. She, she didn't have the ability and the facility to, all the, to do all the technical stuff that she could normally do. So she had to reach down into her heart and soul in order to uh, perform um, convincingly. And it was effective because she got rid of all that other stuff, which is just facade and everything. And she sang from the heart. And that's when she really, really touched her audience. Uh, I thought that was a great interview when she said that. She couldn't sing. She said she didn't have the high notes and all that stuff that she normally does. But so she had to reach down into her, the core of her spirit. And, and that's when she got the best reaction. So remember that. It's not always what you do fancy. It's not about anything. It's about really being honest and sincere about what you do. You know? So uh, music is, is spiritual. You know, and spirituality has nothing to do with technique, you know. So, uh, again, you have to let go of your ego, because uh, that gets in the way of expression all the time. Ego is what pressures you into wanting to impress. You know, you want to go out there and impress people all the time. That's ego, you know. You learn to love yourself and what you do and, and what you can offer. You know, you don't have to impress people all the time. As a matter of fact, um, uh, I, I think that the need to be interesting can make you shallow. And I was thinking about my son because ever since he was in, in school, I used to give him um, a little uh, advice about girls. I used to say, you want to be popular with girls? Uh, I gave him this quote, and I use it all the time with young people. I say, it's better to be interested than to be interesting. You know, if you want girls to like you, be interested in them. Ask them questions, listen to them, instead of trying to impress them all the time. You know, and the same thing with art and music, you know, you don't have to impress anybody. Be interested in the moment, be interested in being honest, and, and you will have more impact, and you will touch more hearts that way, I believe, you know. So by getting ego out of the picture, you start to uh, achieve a certain amount of freedom. And this, to me, is something that I've always strived for as a jazz soloist. I've worked with great jazz players and I admire this, this freedom that they have when they play. It's almost to the point where they disregard the chord changes and it still sounds right. They're so committed to what they're playing. Even if it's totally off the chord change, it still sounds right for some reason. That has to do with commitment and the freedom that they, they have when they're doing it. So freedom allows you to let go of things and just let things flow, right? When you have that freedom, you're not worried about this. Or you're not, you just let things happen. Being in the moment, again, very important. Uh, freedom allows you to enjoy what you're doing and have fun. I think that's the basic thing that you need to do. I mean, the only reason you're playing your instrument is to have fun and enjoy it. I mean, if you go back to whenever you started elementary school or junior high school, that was the main reason, I and mean, you enjoyed it. And, and there's no reason to stop enjoying it, just because you, you know, you, your ego pressures you. You get all this pressure, that, that's, not, that's not very productive and it's not uh, convincing to an audience also. So you want to be honest, you want to have fun. So, and freedom um, uh, lets you have out-of-body experiences. That's an interesting thing. I, yeah, I've had those, I've had moments where I don't remember, like just a few seconds after I stopped playing a solo, I don't remember playing that solo. It wasn't me playing it, it's almost like I could step aside and watch myself play it. Something else took over. This is a great moment, and I hope you guys experience that. I wish I could experience that more often, but I'm hung up with my own ego, you know? I'm trying to play, I'm trying to play good all the time. Getting lost in the music is just a wonderful thing, you know? As a matter of fact, I want to bring this up. I saw this movie, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Black Swan. Has anybody seen Black Swan? Hey, how you doing? 
You guys haven't seen Black Swan? You ought to see that movie, it's really great. And, and one of the things they talk about is, is perfection. Uh, it has to do with this, this ballerina who, who wants to be so perfect in everything she does. Uh, she just is not good for a certain role because of her perfection. And her choreographer says to her, you know, perfection is about letting go. And this is absolutely true. You really reach a lot of perfection when you just don't care about anything and you just let it happen. And you go, ah, that was a perfect solo. You know, and, and the person themselves aren't even conscious they did it because they just let it go. You know. So, you know, some of the best solos uh, ever played probably uh, were out of body experiences. I, I, is this is something weird, but you, actually, I hope one of, you know you all experience that in anything, the way you could just step aside and watch yourself do something because it just happens so naturally. It sounds supernatural. All right. So, uh, freedom also lets you play better with others because you're less preoccupied with your own performance. You're actually listening to the big picture. So, in playing an ensemble, the freedom allows you to to uh, to perform well with a group, and. Um, Freedom allows you also to be simple. Sometimes we try to play too complicated and stuff. You know, if you have complete freedom, you don't have to worry about playing something easy and simple. And it also allows you to play something that you know in a solo, you know. It's just, I don't have to play anything out today. I could just play something within the range and realm of the style. And, and that's fine, because you have total freedom. You're not pressuring yourself all the time. So. Um, uh, and, and freedom also allows you to commit to what you're doing without fear. Fear is always the big factor, you know. It, uh, uh, I always say that, that people should not let fear keep them from doing the things they really want to do. You know, fear is, uh, uh, comes from your ego saying, you're going to fail, you don't want to fail, you know. So you want to keep that out of the picture too. You know, commitment is like... You know, and I, this is another thing I tell my son all the time, you know, whenever he's afraid to do something, I say, just think of it as, as like, you're gonna jump in a cold pool. You see a swimming pool in front of you, you know it's cold. If you stand on the edge and think about it, you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna jump. So, you know, you sit down off to the side or somewhere, and then you make your decision. You say, I'm gonna jump in that pool. You walk out, you jump in. You don't think about it. So that's what commitment is, jumping in, and, and I think that's what Claude Gordon always used to say also, hit it hard and wish it well. I really believe that's what he meant. You go there, you do all your practicing at home. When you get out there, you just do it and give it all you got. You know, that's what hit it hard and wish it well meant to me always. And um, so all this can be achieved by taking the ego out. Ego is, is, uh, is a big factor in holding people back all the time. So. I don't know that people in the South have egos. Do they have egos down here? It seems like a more of a big city thing. But uh, anyway, and then I want to tell you a secret too. For me, a lot of it uh, has to do with um, surrendering to God. You know, I, I don't want to preach right now, but one of the things I do if I'm nervous about anything is I close my eyes and I commit myself to play to the Lord. And I know that the Lord is not judgmental. And, and at that time, it eases all the pressure off me that it's OK to make a mistake. It's OK to make mistakes. And this is something that everybody should know, that it's OK to make mistakes. You know, it's, it's not life changing. Uh, even in a career, they talk about being perfect all the time. It's not true. Even the best of them make mistakes all the time. They make too much of a big deal out of it. It's okay to be human. And uh, especially when you realize that the great power above is not going to judge you for making mistakes. It will judge you according to how much honesty you put into your performance and sincerity. You're not doing this to impress anybody. You're just doing this because this is how I feel right now. So that's okay. And then another thing that I always uh, live by is, um, is a quote from the Bible. It's uh, uh, Timothy. What is that? I, I never knew actually what it was until I asked somebody. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8. And that's, for the Lord did not give you, oh, how does this go? For the Lord did not give us the spirit of fear, but the power of love, the, but of power, love, and of sound mind. 
Um, that means that fear does not come from the Lord. It goes from somewhere else. So don't submit to fear. Fear is the biggest factor in any field. And in music, it's something that can petrify you and panic you, especially playing jazz, because now you're going to expose yourself out there in front of people. You know, you're going to improvise in front of people, and you get all this fear. Forget about it. This fear doesn't come from the Lord, so please leave it alone. Shove it aside. Go out there like a child and have some fun. You have a little vocabulary, go out there and, and talk everybody's head off like a little child. So this is my spiel about jazz. I'm not a you know, a jazz educator, but uh, this is how I feel about jazz. Uh, you know, of course, there's a lot of theory and a lot of practice that goes involved, but you know, mainly I'm concerned with passing on this feeling of freedom that comes with losing fear. You know, and that comes in all genres of music. Does anybody have any questions? No questions? One question. Uh, what ensemble instrumentation do you like playing with the most? Uh, you're talking about like in a, in a horn section or? Uh, no, just, just for improvising yourself. Oh, I really love to play Latin jazz. Latin jazz uh, is something that um, I played a lot of in the 70s. And I really identify with the music, and as a matter of fact, I feel more comfortable playing Latin rhythms than I do just straight ahead swing, you know. So yeah, Latin jazz is, is my favorite. That's why I'm going to perform it tonight. Uh, my tomorrow. daughter's a salsa teacher, so. Is that right? Um, is she here in? Uh, no, she's in Atlanta right now, but uh, she likes that music. Today. Well, tell her to come over for my performance on Saturday. I'll dance with her. <laughs> yeah, really. If you started improvising again from scratch today, would you do it pretty much the same way? Start off with tunes, embellishing, embellishing? Yeah, I think because that's, that's the most important thing is to know the song and then let your heart take you to where you think it should go. And then you should have knowledge of theory so that you could find out there are easier ways to do it. You know, Because once you have the knowledge of theory, then you have even more choices. You know. But I think the basic instincts come from uh, not knowing and just creating at the moment. Staying and being in the moment and you just start embellishing. Uh, the problem with that is if you, if you stay, uh, stay in the habit of doing that, if you make a habit out of doing that, a lot of times you hear soloists uh, that their phrases resemble the song too much. You know, uh, the idea, well, it's not that you must do it, but it's kind of nice. And this is something that I force myself to do sometimes is completely get away from the song. You know, phrases and, you know, the way things are spaced, you know, and then, so it doesn't sound like a bunch of embellishments and fills. So it becomes a composition of its own. So I think it's a good way to start. I think it's a good way to, uh, to introduce you also to chord changes. So he goes, why did I want to do that? Because I heard that. Why did I hear that? Because that's what the changes say, you know? And then you start to compare things like that and you build from there. But it all has to do with creativity. So I think that's a good way to start. Yes, sir? I wanted to ask, what happens if you get stuck with a song uh, that you really didn't know? You didn't know the changes, you don't know anything, you just have to miss them. You really get in a situation like that. Yeah. Yeah, you just, you just play through it. You, you got to uh, trust your ear. And play, yeah, and the more you do it, the better you get at it. You know, it's called faking with confidence. <laughs> yeah, what did I do? I did something recently where I couldn't hear the changes. And, uh, so I just played a little bunch of chromatic stuff. And it all kind of fit. I, I have a funny story, though, about that. I was playing with a big band, and there was an old arrangement of uh, Take the A Train. And I remember Marshall Royal. Marshall Royal was the... Uh, lead alto player with Count Basie's band. And my friend told me this. He was a sax player. He was sitting next to Marshall up there in the front. So there's the trumpet solo. So I'm playing the trumpet solo. Everything is great. Fine, 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 fine. Then the band comes in with this interlude. And then the trumpet starts again. But then it modulates. The chart modulates. And I wasn't expecting that. So I'm going like this. And I'm trying to find it. Where did it modulate? What did it key did it go to? That's a funny thing that happens. See, this is not. This is called not being in the moment. 
I'm panicked. My ear can't hear what key it went to because my ear is still tuned into the old key. So no matter what, I can't hear the new key. I have to see it. Where did it go? Never found it. Never found it. So Marshall Royal, <laughs> really it was terrible. You know, then, then I get the Rodney, uh, what's his name, the, the comedian? Dangerfield. Rodney Dangerfield flop sweats. Instantly starts sweating. All right. So then Marshall Royal turns to my friend and says, did you hear that? <laughs> it's great. He's, my friend still tells that story. But yeah, you just got to trust. Uh, that's why the more you know, the better you, off you are. Yeah, learn songs, learn chord changes. Yes, sir. As you're starting off, do you think it's more important for people to be able to sort of hear the chords or to actually know what the chords actually are? Both. It's good to have the ear training. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of the songs that I play, I don't really know the changes to. I, I could follow by ear. Um, it was funny. One time I was playing a song that they actually had a chart on, and I said, oh, these are the changes? You know, <laughs> it, it actually made it easier to play a solo over, because I forget what the song was. It was just, just some, some standard, like, uh, I love is here to stay, I think it was. Do, 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 you know that song? Has a lot of substitution changes, especially depending on the band that plays it. It played a lot of pretty chord changes to it. And playing it by ear, sometimes you could get lost doing that. And, but if you see a chart, you go, oh, that's what it is. Fairly simple. So reading changes is important because it'll get you out of some tight spot. But training your ear is just as important, maybe more so, I think. Yeah. Any particular scales you would start with, like pentatonic, blues scales? Yeah, I mean, I mean, of course, you start with the diatonic scales. Learn, learn the diatonic scales up and down and broken, you know. Uh, you know what I mean by broken? Well, like if you got a diatonic scale, no. Which way at any angle, yeah, and then of course the arpeggio. Which you know, all kinds of combinations. Then there's combinations where you skip one note and go to the other, and you know, all the diatonic. Then, then uh, minors. You know, and and in actuality, see, once you once you learn the the uh, the diatonic ones. The other ones actually are simple because it's like, you know, D minor. If you're in D minor, you play the, I forget the, like I say, I forget the names of them theoretically. It's one of the idiot scales. But you got D minor. It's, it's the C, it's the C diatonic, you know? So, and then, uh, you know, the, the one that starts on the third. It's, you know, you still use the C diatonic. So it doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter what it's called. It's still the C diatonic. You know, you're just starting on a different note. When you start getting into minors and augmenteds and, you know, augmented ninths and all this kind of stuff, that's when you gotta start studying, you know, individual scales. And uh, you do one by one, you know, just uh, do one by one. You got Jamie Abersall CDs? You know, the, are you hip to those, Jamie Abersalls? They, you know, they have a rhythm section, you play along with them. They got books that you play along with them. And you can just practice any given scale to those things. And uh, it's just one of those things, like I have a friend that he makes up scales. He makes up five note scales. And that's all he'll play in his solos for six months. The ins and outs of this five notes in a scale. I think that's really deep, you know. But he's just a jazz player. He dedicates his life to jazz. I got other things to do. <laughs> Like make money. No, just kidding. See, my comment right now would get me in trouble with, with, with Marsalis. Anyway, uh, hey, all the scales. You know, start with diatonic, learn minors, uh, you know, broken scales, broken arpeggios, all that stuff. And then find out what's different about uh, that scale. Uh, and if it's augmented, what does it do? They have books just on augmented, on augmented scales, which are basically whole tone scales, and augmented chords, which is a different kind of chord. But you learn those and you learn to utilize that. Ultimately, you have to make music with them. 
So that's all like, you get the palette, now what do you do with them? So then you find out what other people have done with them, and then you take it from there, and you embellish on that. Any questions anymore? Uh, who were some of your musical influences growing up? Oh, you know, I always believe, like, especially with trumpet players, trumpet players ended up sounding like the first guy they admired and, and idolized. The first guy that I idolized was, uh, was Al Hurt. He had a thing, that, and I still admire his thing. He had an amazing sense of rhythm. You know, forget the classical stuff and all the corny stuff. He did a lot of corny stuff in his career. I think that's probably why he's not recognized as a major jazz artist. Because he just did some beautiful stuff in his Dixieland stuff. It, sound, technique, and an impeccable sense of rhythm. This, this is wonderful video you could probably find on YouTube where um, he, does a, he was on the uh, Johnny Cash show. Look up Johnny Cash. Have you seen that? It's really wonderful. Johnny Cash show um, with Al Hurt. Look at it, Johnny Cash, Al Hurt. Uh, he does this skit. Johnny Cash had a summer show, and he does this skit about, uh, you know, uh, I forget the name, but the baddest trumpet player in the West, you know. And you see Al Hurt, he's playing live in a saloon setting, and he's just playing his butt off. He just sounds so good. And then uh, Johnny Cash narrates that the such and such Black Bart walks in the bar all dressed in black and he's got mouthpieces in his, in his gun belt, his bullet belt. <laughs> he whips it out and all that. And they're going to do this duel. And the other trumpet player, from my understanding, is Guido Basso. From, um, yeah. And they, they play live. It's just amazing. You know, and I mean, I, I always think about stuff like that. It, even at my age and all these years I've been playing, I don't think I would have sounded that, that nearly as good as these guys, you know, it's just amazing. Al Hurt had a thing. He had a sizzle in his sound, a flare in his, in his shapes and his, his, the colors and an impeccable sense of time. It was really great. And he was my first big influence. And then, of course, I, I, uh, I studied classical music. And all that. I heard Rafael Mendez next, and I wanted to emulate him. When I was in high school, I played all the Rafael Mendez solos, and I used to double and triple tongue real good and all that. You know? And uh, then I heard Clifford Brown and Lee Morgan. I made me, oh, geez, more stuff to work on. So I ended up being a salsa trumpet player. <laughs> yeah. Questions? All right. Now, we're going to have a jam session tonight. Right? You guys know about this? You all know about this, right? I think you should all challenge yourselves to participate, at least on one song. You could do it as a group. You guys could come together and just decide to trade fours with each other or something like that. But just participate and get over the fear of playing public, uh, playing jazz. <laughs> I never played jazz in public. As a matter of fact, I used to say that my greatest contribution to jazz was never to play it in public. You know? <laughs> but uh, I had to break that eventually because people wanted to pay me bucks for that. Like, okay, okay, yeah. But you know, I think it's really good. It's good therapy. It's good for you uh, as a self-achievement. Uh, self I think it makes you stronger. And I think it makes you humble, too. You know, go out and play jazz in public. And tonight is your opportunity to do this. So I really encourage everybody to participate. Please don't make me feel like my, my last 45 minutes have been in vain. So I want to see you get out there. And even if you sound terrible, we'll applaud you, really. Uh, and remember, it's about the Lord, not us. OK, thank you very much.